All right, here we go. We're going to do a little bit of more psychoanalysis and uh, move beyond Freud a little bit because uh, people did change him. All right. Um, there's about uh, three different, really three different Freudian descendants. We'll call them Freudian descendants, or those that took Freud's basic idea. The neo-Freudians, in particular Anna Freud, the others, Melanie Klein is of interest, but uh, I'm not going to get into her. Anna Freud, who took Freud's ideas and sort of uh, expanded them. Orthodox Freudians, ones that were uh, real hardcore Freudians and believed him fully, and then modified, in particular, his concept of the ego. And then some that protested against psychoanalysis and behaviorism, the two kind of leading views at the time, uh, we're talking Maslow and Rogers in humanistic psychology, and we'll talk about them in the next chapter. The major changes that people did to Freudian uh, theory, Freudian theory, is they expanded on this concept of the ego, right? That, um, if you recall, in Freud's basic uh, uh, conception, the id contains all of the instinctive energies. And so, therefore, I mean, we're going to come to this word motivation as we're moving along, but all motivation or the push behind everything we do comes from the id's instinctive energies. They said, no, 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 no. The ego has, it's independent of that id more. It's its, its own. It functions separate. It's a different thing, okay? There's a removal of some of the biological forces or um, the real hardcore biology that uh, Freud said, you know, the biology is destiny, and we'll come back to that. And, in fact, they were more likely to incorporate social and psychological uh, conflicts rather than these in, in uh, biological things. And so we find that... Um, we find that... Uh, I don't know what we find. Whatever. Minimize importance of sexual whatever. Okay. Blah, blah, blah. So Anna Freud was his daughter, and uh, she was his secretary for many, 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 many years. She uh, used to sit in and the meetings. His uh, he, he had the Vien Viennese Psycho Psychoanalytic Association, this real big, the bunch of the big wig players. And she always sat in the corner uh, for years, even when she was a little girl. Well, she she studied, very interesting, she applied Freud's um, theories to uh, children, mostly. And it's kind of an interesting thought, because it's uh, hard to have a discussion of childhood conflicts being at the root of personality disorders when the person you're working with is, in fact, a child. So she basically uh, took Freudian psychology and applied it to... Uh, making the children create healthy egos while they were developing, okay? Um, but m most of it was she She had very many, uh, very, very much overlap with her father. I mean, she was the one that was with him every single day until the day he died of um, uh, cancer, throat cancer. So, whoa, come on. One of the major players uh, in the role of early psychoanalysis or psychoanalytic dissenters was Carl Jung. Carl Jung is an interesting character. He um, he read the interpretation of dreams. He was a physician in um, Switzerland somewhere. I can't remember. Basel, Switzerland, maybe? I don't remember. But anyway, he wrote, read the interpretation of dreams, Freud's masterpiece, or main, main, he had many books, but his main one. Um, he started to have correspondence. They met each other in 1907, and it lasted 13 hours. Uh, he, Freud was much older. Um, in 1909, a very big deal. Clark University in the United States had started in their psychology department in 1884, I guess it was. So 1909 was the 25th anniversary of Clark University's um, psychology department, and it turned out that uh, G. Stanley Hall was the uh, the psychologist who happened to be president of Clark University, and he invited Sigmund Freud to be the, the keynote speaker at the university's uh, anniversary. And um, Freud, first off, rejected the offer because it didn't pay enough, all right? <laughs> it didn't pay him enough. So he was like, no, I'm going to lose more money than that by not doing my practice, so um, they sent him a larger check, and he accepted, and he convinced Carl Jung to go with him, and so Carl Jung and Sigmund Freud's um, trip to the United States was a big deal, because uh, up until 1909, when this lectures occurred, this uh, psychoanalysis thing was clearly a Jewish 
European thing. It was not American or non-Jewish. I mean, it was just, it had a very narrow focus. And this particular uh, trip to uh, Clark University was the opening of the door of psychoanalysis to the world. 1911, he became the president of the International Psychoanalytic Association. The international one, not just the Viennese ones. Um, but they had problems because he wasn't Jewish. Um, Freud said, yeah, he's going to do it. And so he was basically, you know, the surrogate son, the, the guy who's going to take over when Freud dies. Um, unfortunately, Carl Jung puts out his first book, The Psychology of the Unconscious. And uh, there were some major differences between Freud and, and his beliefs in this book. Um, he, he knew it was going to piss off Freud, but he did it anyway, and it really pissed off Freud. I mean, really. He, I, I actually, at one point, uh, this was my history of psychology course. I wrote about Carl Jung, wrote my, my major paper <laughs> about Carl Jung. And uh, that paper, uh, I, I did a lot of reading on the correspondence between Jung and Freud. They, they wrote an average of like three letters per day. I don't know how the hell they wrote so many letters, but at least they didn't have texting, right? So Carl Jung's, a few of his uh, different ideas, he, he proposes this thing called the libido, a creative force that provides the energy for personal growth. We're going to find that Carl Jung's ideas here are going to preclude, preclude, precede. They're going to um, hint at what we're going to find in humanistic psychology, in particular the concept of self-actualization that the humanistic psychologists work with. Um, clearly, Carl Jung's ideas are out there that, um, as in Freudian view, you know, uh, motivation was based on unconscious desires and stuff, whereas um, that is to say that your behaviors are pushed by unconscious forces, Carl Jung is going to say that you're sort of pulled toward potentials or something like that. It's funny, for Jung, this libido is this generalized life energy, not just a sex energy. Um, this energy is in growth, reproduction. This is, in fact, uh, I wonder if this is on my next slide. Um, no, no, but th this idea, I don't know, I swear, I think I saw it. Anyway, um, this uh, libido is sort of like driven by um, entelechy. Entelechy is sort of like this uh, force in the universe, this force in the universe that drives things to become. Um, this goes way back. This is an Aristotle idea, and it's just sort of like... Um, Okay, from Star Wars, the force, okay, the force, the universe's pull to, you know, have things happen or something. We'll, we'll expand on this when we get into the uh, Motivation 101, which is, I believe, the next show. So the ego, according to Jung, is um, a very cognitive. I mean, the way Carl Jung describes the ego is kind of reminds me of something that would come out of a cognitive psychology book more than anything. It's, um, in Carl Jung's basic idea, in Freud's theory, the ego was the central character, the one, right? And um, it, for, for Carl Jung, it was, well, it was there, but it wasn't that big of a deal. Because Carl Jung makes a difference between the personal unconscious and then the collective unconscious. The personal unconscious is pretty similar to what Freud um had referred to that at this point when this uh, this slide you might as well refer to the personal unconscious that Carl Jung refers to is essentially just the unconscious as as Freud refers to but according to Carl Jung this is really not that big of a deal this is really not that important okay and so instead he argues that the collective unconscious that this is a part of the unconscious mind that reflects universal human experiences through the ages um I'm a, I, I can I can dig this as a as a guy that leans heavily on um, biology and anybody that sat into one of my other classes is that I wouldn't necessarily get to it here in history but in my other classes you'll hear me say something like um, here here we are uh, living in the 21st century and we're just cavemen all right and we're running around and our behaviors are often inexplicable often like why the hell did they do that and then you stop and think about it and you go you know what if a caveman was put into that situation, that's exactly what a caveman would do. So that's why that person did it. And the collective unconscious is sort of like that. That um, you are um, you that 
all human beings around the world at all times have uh, faced very similar problems and have had similar solutions and things of this nature. So according to um, Carl Jung, we, he had these archetypes. They're like an, an inherited predisposition to respond emotionally to certain categories of experience. To me, it sounds like an instinctive reaction to a situation which is common across the world. I, I mean, the archetypes of the collective unconscious can be thought of as the DNA of the human psyche. I don't know. It's a nice little quote. But like I said, I think about it different than this. I think about it, as I said, in terms of um, a biological predisposition or not a biological, uh, yeah, but an inborn uh, predisposition to respond to certain things in certain ways. So, wait a minute. I missed this slide right here. All right. Oh, here, yeah. This is just some words. He had a bunch of different archetypes, and it's really kind of interesting. But really, he had, you know, the just predetermined ways of responding in certain situations. And so, lo and behold, in some situations, it's pretty... the Well, whatever. You know what? Move it on. So, he did... He did um, have somewhat of a deterministic belief with Freud. I mean, he, he had a different reason for the deterministic belief, right? Um, kind of like a universal thing rather than a personal thing. Here's that teleology. The doctrine that states, um, I, I used entelechy, which is a force in the universe. Teleology is sort of like the, uh, the theory itself or something. The doctrine that states that at least some human behavior is purposive and is directed to the attainment of future goals. All right, People are not necessarily just pushed by the past. See, that's what Freud said. He said behavior is deterministic because it's pushed by the past. You can really much, you can pretty much predict everything that's going to happen if you know the past. But Carl Jung says not only are you pushed by the past, but also you're pulled by the future or possibilities. And this is where we're going to expand into the um, self-actualization in the next material. And synchronicity is this really interesting thing. It, what occurs when um, unrelated events in your life come together in a meaningful way, and he said that these are not just coincidences. He says, this is, you know, people just write it up, oh, it was coincidence. It's just, I happen to be thinking about Mary, and Mary said, ben, oh, there it was in the mail. All right, what? No, it's not. It's not coincidence, he says. It's a spiritual guiding force at work. Remember, the force is with you, right? The, the force is guiding the universe. Another one of the earlier um, descendants of Freud was Alfred Adler. Alfred Adler, by the way, is an interesting thing. We need to know that uh, he caught, I think it was polio as a kid. Polio... And he had a lot of medical problems, okay? And so we're going to find that um, Sigmund Freud has makes reference to, to these conflicts, in particular sexual conflicts, as being at the root of, of personality issues. What Alfred Adler is going to do, and this comes directly out of his experiences, he's going to use this concept of um, feelings of inferiority. And this is based solely on the fact that he himself, having been crippled his whole life, had these feelings of inferiority. So he uh, joined Freud's discussion group in 1902. He starts to get critical a little bit of some of the sex things. He becomes the president of the Viennese Psychoanalytic Society. Freud wants to maybe uh, patch things up, but it doesn't last. And there's a broken heart between Adler and Freud. So they gave up. He goes off to the war. He comes back, and he develops this, uh, uh, his own version of psychology called individual psychology. His theory of personality incorporates social and biological. Um, as I said, the social forces is in uh, feelings of inferiority in particular. And so here, here we read, right, social forces, not biological instincts, are the central causes of human behavior. Gotcha. Um we learn experiences our infancy, uh, not so much sex. Future goals have a greater effect than past experiences. Yep, we're pulled more by the future than pushed by the past. Um, he makes reference to compensation. As I said, his concept of feelings of inferiority being at the root of these conflicts that we have. Compensation is the making up for a weakness by developing strengths in other areas. Um, kind of... We're, we're pulled to take care of our weaknesses, kind of, okay? Um, 
And so finally, as I said here, he had these feelings of inferiority based on the fact that he was sick all the time. Um, he says there's this lifelong push and pull between inferiority and striving for superiority. This is um, very, very... This draws heavily on some of the earlier existential work. In particular, it pulls on uh, Superman. What's his name? Uh, oh, gosh. You remember the uh, philosopher and the Superman, Nietzsche. He, this pulls really heavily on Nietzsche's idea of the Superman and striving for superiority. Um, but it provides us this uh, compensating for feelings of inferiority provides us some motivation to move on. Meanwhile, we've got Karen Horn Eye. You notice I put a horn and an eye. Don't even go there, okay? Horn Eye. So now, she had some real issues with her uh, father took off, abandoned her. Her mother was uh, didn't really seem to love her all that much, rejected her. So clearly, she... As I said, Alfred Adler had these feelings of inferiority because he had physical disabilities. Karen Horney felt that uh, all, all, all conflicts were the result of um, uh, um, fear of abandonment, essentially. Fear of abandonment became her largest uh, driving force. And so, in general, she thought that personality um, is uh, not is changeable, right? That it's not sex that's driving it. It's, as I said, feelings of uh, abandonment or, or worries about abandonment. Okay? She thought Oedipal theory was a load of kaplui. Um, she was basically the very first, uh, in fact, I believe that her, her work evolved into what was called feminist psychology. If I, feminist psychology? Something. But anyway, she was clearly the, the feminist of her day in this area. Um, men are... <laughs> Women are motivated by penis envy. No, she says. Men are instead motivated by woman envy. All right, gotcha, Freud. So we find that not these these they they have a lot of similarities with Freud. That these these conflicts exist and these conflicts go under and these conflicts emerge and these conflicts result. The question is, what are the conflicts? Are they psychosexual conflicts, as Freud argued? Are they uh, are they uh, 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 conflicts uh, based on the uh, collective, uh, based on the, the experiences of our entire species, as Jung might argue, are they conflicts which are based on feelings of inferiority? Are they conflicts based on senses of abandonment? There's a lot of different people that said a lot of different stuff, but I mean, in a lot of ways, we call them dissenters, but the fact is, they really took about 80% of what Freud had to say, and they just had, you know put a tweak on it, right? So the next time we're going to come back here and we're going to find the humanists, and the humanists are a pretty big rejectors of Freud, all right? And we'll talk the humanists, and they are interesting. In fact, before we talk the humanists, we're going to talk Motivation 101 in the next slideshow.